Okay, now the second half of the story. We're focusing on this idea of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean to love Allah? Hmm. I think, you know, like anything else in, the, in Islam, there's different levels. Okay. And the first level, the, the bottom level you could say, is that we love Allah because we have to love Allah. Okay. It's wajib. I mean, hmm. this is if some, if like a, a faqih, a jurist is speaking to you. Did you you have to... So let me see if I understand you. So yeah. you can't walk up to any Muslim anywhere in the world and say, do you love Allah? He says, no. Right. <laughs> that level. The that, level of, yeah, that's, of course not, you know? Right, okay. So then the second level would be, our love is contingent upon what Allah gives us, which Allah gives us everything. Right. I mean, every breath of air you've ever breathed, every bite of food, your parents, your clothes, your wealth, the wealth in your pocket, your kids, your whatever it is. And that's a lot. That's a lot. That's everything. There's that's nothing everything. else. You know? Everything so, we've ever been given by, any, by anybody is actually given to us by Allah. Exactly. So our, the next level up, obviously, is that our love is based upon that. And that's a, that can be a very strong level, don't get me wrong. Right. And then the top but there's level, still more. So it's good, but there's more. As far as I understand, I don't think I'm... I, I'm not at there, so it's just all theoretical. Okay, me. so now we're going to look up to that and try to go, <laughs> right. inshallah. The third level would be that you love Allah because Allah is Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ta and He's the only deserving party of love at all. He's, he's the creator of love, in fact. So you've purified yourself to the point that you see things as they are. Your heart sees with a basira. It sees with clear wisdom and perception. And you realize that, as Tariq beautifully pointed out, everything else is contingent existence. There's nothing's really there. We're not saying there's no matter. We're not that kind of you know, school of thought. It's here, we're dealing with it, you exist, I exist, it's hasanat, sayyat, everything's here. But in the most real sense of being there, there only is Allah. So is what you're saying at that third level, if I understand you correctly, is you begin to realize that. And then you've completely annihilated your own self, in the sense of you want nothing for yourself. But you're still aware of your own existence. And because you are, you still have an ability to love something, to be attached. And so you love Allah, and that kind of is the highest level. From what I, I've been told. <laughs> May Allah give us that. I mean, it's high enough for us to ask for it. <laughs> That's for sure. I think at that level, like you know, Matthew was saying, it's really theoretical you know, for people like us, and <laughs> we can only aspire to it. But I think that's one of the important reasons that level is there, is to aspire to it. Okay. Is to really see that there's a, a huge spectrum of love. But it's, it's not just the contingent and the absolute reality. It's also, who, who can we rely on? Who will get us out of trouble? Who will make us happy when we're sad? Who will comfort us? In reality? Is Allah. Only Allah. Is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you realize that, you don't want to rely on anything or anyone or ah. have hope in anyone or anything except that entity, which is for us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's absolute, that is immutable, that's not changed, and that gives us everything, that's a source of everything for us. I think that's amazing, Tariq, because when we realize that we only have Allah, we cease to want to rely on anyone else, or to ask anyone else. I think that we have to be deluded to a certain extent to start relying on other things and wanting other things. Exactly, and I, for me personally, that maybe this will, to share a personal story, what will help me put this in perspective, mm -hmm. is when you realize that no matter how bad you've been, no matter how much you've sinned, that Allah Ta'ala will forgive you. Mm -hmm. And not just that, but Allah Ta'ala will love you for asking for forgiveness. And if you fall again and you turn to Him, He'll love you. And then you, you're at that, in amongst those that Allah Ta'ala loves, the absolute loving you, how could you not love Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala when you know about this? That there's hope, this is ultimate hope. I mean, to talk about real hope, security, mm. Mm. Uh, comfort, this is it. There's nothing beyond this that and you we can have ask to, for. And we have to be deluded to tie this to the older episode about death, the one before. We have to be deluded to start putting our hope in the dunya, what we call tul al amal, exactly. this excessive hope. If you really want to put your hope, put your hope in Allah. Yes, and Allah says, khayrun amala. In, in the Quran, Allah mentions how to look forward to Allah and to the afterlife. It's really, that's the best place to put your hope. Don't put your hope in the dunya. Put your hope in the one who created the dunya. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the thing about this level that we're talking about, this that Matthew has you know, explained for us, this highest level, right. is that some people in, in our tradition uh, have, have been at that level. And we hear statements of them and we read them in the books and stuff like that, is how they only worship Allah Ta'ala because of Allah, not for fear of hellfire or longing for, for Jannah. But the thing is, is that this is a state, I, I, and I, I believe this is a state that is given to somebody by Allah. It's mm. not a state that you can get to by your own efforts. I mean, obviously you have to 
work and, and do... So you're not saying don't make effort, but you're saying exactly. it's not really you a You can't like act like all of a sudden, I don't care about anything, I only want to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It comes to you as a gift. Okay. Most of us are going to be in that middle level. Is right. that we, we are loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the things He gives us and for fear of His hellfire. We go back and forth, we oscillate between these two. Right. We want Jannah, we do good, He gives us, you know... Uh, good things in this life, but we're also fearful of his wrath, so we try to avoid what he has prohibited for us. Well, I think it's interesting. I also think that a distinction needs to be made here, because there's a difference between wanting. Allah subhanahu wa taala asks us to worship him and to call onto him out of fear and out of hope, khawfan wa tamaan, as you know. And then, well, if you want, if you want, if you want uh, to be alleviated from, if you don't want to go to hellfire, that's out of fear of hellfire. And if you want paradise, that's out of hope for paradise. I think what the righteous people you mentioned did was they, they still have fear and hope, but they have fear of Allah, not anything physical Allah might punish them with, and they had hope for Allah, not anything physical Allah might give them. So they still have fear and hope, so the Quranic directive is still fulfilled by them, but they don't have the fear and hope of physical things. And this reminds me of a tradition that Imam al-Ghazali mentions in one of his books in um, Arba'in fi usul al-Din, the 40 foundational principles uh, of religion. We did a show about this earlier in Stairway to Paradise, and how he was passing by Sayyidina Isa, the Prophet Jesus, alayhi salam, peace be upon him and upon all prophets of God and our Prophet, وسلم, passing by a group of people. And they said that they had isolated themselves for worship. So he said, What are you doing? They said, We isolated ourselves for worship. So what are you asking for? And they said, We ask for paradise. What are you fearing? They said, We fear. Hellfire, and he said, "Makhlukan khiftum wa makhlukan rajautum." You have feared a creation, and you have sought for, and you know uh, yearned for and asked for and desired a creation. That's the level that Imam Ghazali said that other people, like the righteous people you mentioned, and he mentioned some of them, have transcended. They've gotten to a point where they still have fear and hope. So the the common denominator is there, but it's fear of Allah, not of anything He's created, and hope for Allah. And to make this last subtle point. It means that you don't want Allah in the afterlife because of the things He can give you or to be more specific, only because of what He can give you. So it becomes kind of like a maslaha, a benefit. I'm worshipping you because of the benefit I'll get out of you. I'm worshipping you because I seek you and I yearn for you and I have hope in you and I know that when you're content with me and you're pleased with me, that manifests itself physically into a paradise and I have a body so I'm going to go to that paradise. And when you're angry with me and incur I incur your wrath and may that never be the case for any of the viewers or any of us inshallah may Allah save us all that manifests itself physically into a hellfire and so I have fear of the manifestation of your anger but ultimately you can get rid of hellfire you can get rid of paradise I still worship you I don't want benefit and the righteous person did say I won't worship Allah like a servant not meaning she's not a servant but meaning that like a servant who waits for his wage mm. give yeah. me something you it's know? kind of like an infant at the, and and mm -hmm. you know we're spiritual infants, you could say, and we're growing. Absolutely. Hopefully, inshallah. May Allah make us grow. Yeah. Uh, the infant at the beginning of its life, it just it loves. Let's say it loves the father, because the mother has always got this special bond. But it loves the father. <laughs> yeah. Because we can tell you just haven't had an infant recently. <laughs> I think because I did too. But go right. on. He loves the father because he gives them. When the father has food, the infant really loves him. He comes to him. And exactly. It's based on it's all this. The love is often based on food, even with the mother at times. <laughs> no, but yeah. particularly with the father. Right. And then as time goes on, it's not just about the food. And you see this. Like the infant starts loving the father because he's his dad. Right. His daddy. And when the father leaves, the infant start the child, I should say, starts crying and mm. he wants his father to stay. It's mm. not because he thinks the father's just gonna give him food. There's no food. Dad's got no food. That's right, not what no, he's thinking. That's not what he's thinking. He's thinking, Daddy's leaving. I want daddy to be with me. So it, the love grows. It becomes essential to exactly. the essence of the father. We have a break. We'll be back uh, after that. To, to, not to interrupt you, Matthew, but we'll come back. And um, that's the whole point. It's a beautiful point Matthew brought up that the infant or the child, as he specified, starts loving the father now. And he says father because we struggle because obviously infants, child, all of us children, you know, we just love our mothers more. The Prophet ﷺ said and did say your mother, your mother, your mother, your mother, then your father. But anyway, uh, the child will love the father for the essence, not just for what the father could have given him. And this is kind of where we're going with this, so we'll be back after the break to talk about it a little bit more.